morning class. It's after midnight on uh, Wednesday, so it's technically morning. Uh, I wanted to get this out to you, the vision lecture. I put it in two parts here, but we'll talk about vision. Obviously, you know, very important to us primates as humans. Uh, we are active during the day so that we can see beautiful, sharp uh, color and vision. And we have our eyes in front of our head. We had see two different images and our mind puts it together. Great depth perception. All right, well, we'll talk more about that. All right, so this guy up here is a, uh, it's a robber fly. It's a type of fly, but it has um, beautiful compound eyes. <clears throat> There's many eyes in the animal world. And these guys, like the flies, these are all individual eyes with tiny little lenses in them so they can see all around them. Really hard to swat one because you can see everywhere, right? It's kind of fun. Look at this, you can, if you blink, you know, it's constantly changing. It's like you see the, the snapshot of it, you know, in the movie, if you just blink, you just see little pieces of it. So give it a try, it's fun. All right, so vision. Um, Chemoreception definitely came first. <clears throat> Organisms uh, going towards chemicals like food sources or away from uh, predators or toxic chemicals. But then vision come about really early. I mean, even think about in, in biology and zoology, the simplest creatures, the jellyfish and coral. Some jellyfish have uh, eye spots around them. So they know up and down. And then uh, flatworms from biology, very simple, simple um, um, animals they have a, um, uh, eyes that are in these cups, so like a dark background. And so that allows them to tell which direction is light. So they can't make an image, but they, at least they know when they're under the rock or on top of it, when, you know, when it gets in the darkness, which is nice to get away from, from predators. So they go from that and then um, squid and octopus have like unique looking eyes and spider eyes. And then of course those compound eyes of insects. So eyes came about different types of eyes and different creatures uh, came about <clears throat> um, because we live on a planet uh, with a sun where light is reflected and it's uh, useful information to be able to see the visual world. Although some things live without eyes and they make it. If some creatures go into caves and lose eyes because it's not useful without light, uh, eyes are photoreceptors that get photons of light, wavelengths. Be a wave or particle, you know, get into physics too much, but um, what hits it is going to uh, um, then trigger the brain that light has hit that. And we have enough of them, millions of them, that we can get make a nice image. Just like your camera on your phone has a receptor on there, you can make an image. So our eyeballs, they sit in these eye sockets. Remember the skull, there's like seven different bones, or something like that, that make up uh, your orbits that hold your eyes. And in life, you know, we'll take a look at the eyeball, that sclera, the whites of your eyes is really tough. They're about two and a half centimeters, about an inch in diameter, these, these spheres that are your eyeballs. And uh, you can see they have these six eye muscles, extrinsic eye muscles in each that move the eyes very quickly in different directions. And you see the nerves, the big optic nerve leaving it. And then you also know abducens, trochlear and oculomotor nerves go to various muscles that move the eyeball. And then I should say your eye socket is filled with lots of fat and connective tissue. So in st starving people, the eyes will appear sunken because you've even used the, the fat around your eyes if your body is in starvation mode. And then we'll talk about next semester, uh, Graves disease or uh, issue with uh, thyroid hormones where the bulging eyes, if you have connected tissue, tissue is inflamed, it'll cause the eyes to bulge. Anyway, but normally they sit in the socket, well protected um, by these bones. I just thought I'd remind you, we got to look, take, took a look at a cow eye, which it looks a lot like our eye. If you were to cut open a human eye, I've cut open a lot of human eyes. Um, our pupil is round and, you know, and it's preserved the lens is, is opaque. It's not clear as it is in, in life, but uh, uh, y'all have seen uh, <clears throat> models of the eye and, uh, and, and some cow eyes. All right, so first of all, you know, the vision part of it's gonna be the rods and cones in your retina. That is the light sensor, like in the back of your camera, you know, the, the, digital camera, 
um, that it has a sensor and array back there. <clears throat> but there's also all, all kinds of accessory things that go along with that. We have eyelids that blit, that protect the eye when you're sleeping and they blink. And we have lacrimal glands. Lacrimal glands are tear glands. And they're up here, superior lateral to your eyes. And they make these tears that I'll talk about. And they, they wash over your eyes like windshield wipers and windshield wiper fluid uh, to keep them uh, clean. They even have lysozyme, an enzyme that fights bacteria to keep infections from growing on this moist eye, right? Um, and of course, the eye muscles that move the eye. Uh, these are all accessories to the, the, the what's going to be really the star of the show is your retina with the rods and cones, but you need focusing apparatus, you need light aperture apparatus, you need eyelids, you need to keep it wet and, uh, and clean too. Look at this eye. Let's see if we can take a look here. Yeah, you'll also see you know, we have an upper and lower eyelid. And then if you look at your cat when it just wakes up, it has, has a third eyelid that comes across horizontally. Or you see like Shark Week, you see that, 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 that eyelid that comes out that kind of protects a shark's eyes when it's feeding. But that third eyelid is, you'll see it in frogs and, and, and fish and, and uh, other mammals. We don't have it. We have a little remnant of it, this little, little bit right there. But, Maybe you see, you, know, you see your dog wake up and this other eyelid comes across, looks kind of freaky. Yeah, and we'll see the tears being produced. And as you blink, they're gonna wash over the eye like that. And they collect here immediately. And you'll see there's little ducts that carry it into your nasal cavity normally. All right, let's talk eyelids. <clears throat> so your eyelid is the thinnest skin in your body, very, very thin. You have thin skin and then you're gonna have muscle this is muscle. Another name for the eyelid is palpebra. And so levator palpebra superioris means it's the superior upper eyelid. It's going to elevate it. Yeah, big fancy name for that. Um, and there's, there's kind of a solid area in there, this um, connective tissue. It's pretty solid and that muscle will pull on it, you know, to open up your eyes. And don't forget obicularis oculi, so the muscle around your, your eyes uh, that will help close the eyelids. <clears throat> And then looking, we'll see on the inside of the eyelid uh, is going to be this membrane conjunctiva. Remember that? It goes up on the whites of your eyes there as well. Yeah. And then eyelashes are, are unique large hairs that are going to help protect uh, uh, your eyes. Eyebrows, too, I'll talk about. Yeah. Oh, and then there's these tarsal glands. There's these, they're modified uh, sebaceous glands. Remember, sebaceous glands make your hair oily. Uh, here they make kind of an oil that goes all around the edges of your eyelids to prevent them from sticking together. You, know, you still wake up with those sleepy seeds, your eyes are kind of stuck together, but uh, um, this produces an oil around the edges. <clears throat> and another thing you can see obviously here is that um, if you put contacts in, you know, they're never going to roll to the back of your eyeball, right? You know, this is a cul-de-sac, right? Yeah. I know you guys know that, but just in case. So that conjunctiva is a thin membrane. And so it goes on the inside of your eyelids and it's pretty thick there. And then it comes out on the whites of your eyes. It doesn't go over the cornea, but all around it. It's a little membrane you can move around has blood vessels in it. And it may excretes a little bit of the fluid too in there. And uh, when it becomes infected, you can have either viral or bacterial conjunctivitis or pink eye. So that's what's going on there. The blood vessels dilate and, you're, and your eyes look really red and they're... Uh, itchy and uh, uncomfortable. Yeah, so you got it, conjunctiva. It doesn't go over your cornea. You can see it right at the edge of the cornea and then it's gonna coat the inside of your eyelids up and down. All right, I have a couple slides here just to talk about uh, tears and, uh, and eyebrows and eyelashes. So um, eyelashes, yeah, they're unique hairs. And uh, in fact, yeah, it's kind of interesting. We don't know why, but they don't turn gray. The rest of your hair turn gray and your eyelashes will, will still be dark. Um, and uh, yeah, you can see that they're, these are a little ridiculous, a little crazy, but um, they're gonna you know, protect your eyes from things getting into it, dust or insects like that. And your eye, um, eyebrows here, are not just cosmetic, <laughs> they, uh, they're gonna, your forehead sweats a lot. And so they're gonna help uh, take that sweat and move it so it doesn't just pour into your eyes, you know, so. Eyebrows will help protect your eyes from sweat, or a headband can do that too. Eyelashes are another protection there. Yeah, because your cornea and your eyes are very sensitive. 
and then tears. And amazingly, you know, how many tears do you produce? We're talking about 15 to 30 gallons. All right, think about a gallon of milk and put 30 of them out here, yeah. Um, a lot of these are just the basal tears. We make tears constantly, uh, usually more when we're awake and blinking, and the tears will, will wash over our eyes. And they keep them wet and keep them clean. Any dust will be, you know, every time you blink, they will be uh, washed out. And yes, uh, women, three to four times as many tears as men. I don't know. Men are, uh, are dead inside. <laughs> no, kidding. Uh, but, you know, it's just, it's just a fact of life here, uh, biology. Um, and then tears are, are in fact, made uh, slightly oily. It's water, salt water that's coming down, and, and it, uh, it's going to keep your eyes clean as you blink you know, each time. Remember, the tears will come super and lateral, and they go across the eye towards the middle. And we'll see that there's ducts that go into your nasal cavity from there. And you're different. There's a, yeah, there's a difference between tears that are emotional tears and uh, tears that are just basally produced and irritant tears. So if you're in a real dusty or onions and that's irritating the eye, you'll produce tears. Uh, emotional tears have additional things in those tears, actually, uh, hormones and such. And uh, uh, I believe I'll get into that next semester, talk a little bit about an experiment where we collect tears and you can see how it lowers men's testosterone. I know. I see I'm teasing you with that, but if you hang around, you get the whole story. Um, one thing about elderly people, they, they don't produce enough tears often, they, and they have dry eyes. So you'll have, there's drugs or obviously eye drops that can, can help with that. All right, so lacrimal gland. It's about the size of an almond. It's kind of like almond shaped, and it looks like a gland, and it's in your orbit on the upper outside of your eyes, on either side, lacrimal gland. And little tiny ducts will make the tears that are constantly produced that uh, when you blink, it'll wash over the eye each time like a windshield wiper. If you look in the, the mirror up close and you look at the medial side of your eyes, give me two little dots, holes right here, even like a little bump with holes in them. And these little holes go into little caniculi, little canals, that will go as a little sac here, lacrimal sac. Remember our lacrimal bones were here? There's kind of like a groove there. The tears will, will collect there, and then uh, they go down a nasolacrimal duct, which means nose, tear, ducts, right? And, uh, and you know, you produce, you start tearing up, your nose starts running because the fluid goes right into your nose right there. It actually reminds me, I had a, a friend, Tony, I guess I won't say his last name, he's a professor now. Um, but he uh, had a trick where he could uh, put a shot glass full of water on his eye and he could blow bubbles out his eye. <laughs> you all have that capability. Um, because indeed, um, your, your, your nasal cavity is connected by these canals into your eye. And so you can blow up bubbles out there. Yeah. And if your eardrum is pierced, you could blow up a balloon from your ear too. You know, if you, you have a hole in your eardrum or tubes or something like that, yeah. So things are connected. But these tears will be produced. They get washed medially and there's a little kind of a lake there, a little depression where the tears will, will catch and they'll be, uh, go through these little uh, punk, these little holes into these caniculi to the sac. And then they, they, from either side, they'll empty into your nasal cavity kind of hidden under one of those nasal conchae. That's what happens with the tears. All right, eye muscles. So I talked about these with the cranial nerves and uh, now I want you to know, know the six different uh, extrinsic eye muscles. Remember, intrinsic eye muscles would move the lens or your pupil, like within the eye. Extrinsic means they go from the eye and they're connected to the bones to move the eyeballs about. And these muscles are easy. You're going to have four rectus, meaning straight ones, like rectus abdominis, rectus femoris, they go straight back. Superior, inferior, medial, lateral, rectus muscles. And then two oblique means at an angle. You have a superior, inferior, oblique. All right, so four plus two makes six extrinsic eye muscles. And obviously your lateral rectus will move your eye outward. Your medial rectus move it inward, superior move it up, inferior move it down. And then the oblique ones is a little more complex. 
And yeah, these things have just amazing uh, speed and uh, accuracy, I guess you'd say. Imagine your, your eyes darting across a computer screen or, or reading a book. I mean, so they just have the smallest motor units in your body. Um, but that superior oblique is a weird one. I'll show you another picture, but I'll show you here. It, it, it comes this way, then it goes through a pulley, then it comes across. Look at it change direction across that pulley. Yeah. Hmm. And it's going to move it, uh, and by, by, pull, by the way it's connected, it's going to move it down and lateral like that. And um, the inferior is going to move it uh, upward and outward or lateral a little bit. So uh, they move it slightly different. The, the rectus are more straightforward, just moving it up, down, right, left, uh, medial lateral. Um, yeah, I'll show you another view. This is from above. So looking down from above. And here you can see, uh, I'm just showing you this superior oblique. It goes underneath superior rectus there. But you see it comes over into pulley and then it goes back. So it really changes direction. And the nerve is the trochlear nerve, right? cranial nerve, and it's going to, because trochlea means pulley, and this is why I keep calling it a pulley. It's like a little sling where it changes direction. Eh, pretty cool. You guys recognize this one? That'll be lateral rectus, right? One more view, looking straight in. So you see the rectus, easy, superior, inferior, lateral, medial, or towards the nose, right? And then you can see the obliques, the superior will go under the rectus and then it changes the directions. And the inferior just comes across. The section lab will look for it under here. Yeah, and they're gonna move your eyeballs. And amazingly, your, your, your mind, if, like if my right eye, if I wanna look to the right, my right eye, I'm gonna be abducting the eye. And then my left eye, I'm gonna be adducting. And so my eye, two eyes, as they follow objects in space, are moving opposite muscles, you know? So it's pretty cool. All right. I would say any questions, but you know, I can't really hear you right now. Um, let's get to the, the eye. Look at this beautiful, the structure of the eye. Oh, so we talked about the lashes, your eyebrows, the eyelids, uh, the muscles that move the eye, your tears that come across. Now let's get serious here. You can see, I think you all, I know we did this anatomy, you know, this is the beautiful blue part here. This is the iris, which is gonna make the pupil as you can look into someone's soul. And then we look here, this, this is the whites of your eyes, this is the sclera, and I can see the conjunctiva on it. See the little blood vessels right on there? Yeah. And I'm looking at the edge of the eyelid. It looks, you imagine here is gonna be where those tarsal glands will make a little bit of oily substance to keep uh, the eyes from sticking. And then I can't see it, but there'd be a little hole here and here to drain the tears. And this is this little remnant of our third eyelid right there too. Awesome. All right, so overall eyeball. And you guys, you've, you've seen this, you studied this for lab, you're gonna study for the practical. So I'll, I'll go kind of quickly, but you have three uh, layers, they're called tunics and a tunic is a, uh, a coat, you know, a tunic is a coat. So that's where it comes from, there's three coats. And the outer one is the fibrous tunic. It's that sclera and the cornea. So it's the outer layer. Then the middle one is called the vascular tunic because lots of blood vessels. And that's the darkness in the back of your eye. And the front, it's gonna make the iris and the, the ciliary body that moves the lens, right? And then the inner tunic is your retina, that's the, the, the computer, the delicate part with all the rods and the cones. So the retina, the nervous tunic would be the inside. So you have fibrous and then vascular, or this choroid coat. And then the inner is the retina, the nervous coat. So the sclera is the, when you see the whites of someone's eyes um, with conjunctive over it. But uh, so the sclera is, uh, is really wicked strong lots of collagen fibers and they're going every which direction. So it looks uh, white, looks whitish. Um, and the front part of it, sclera is the cornea and the cornea, you know, is clear. That's the clear part you can see. And if you see someone from the side or it really bulges out. So the sclera and then the cornea really bulges out and the cornea is gonna be 
people scratch it, you know, it's got lots of nerve fibers on it, painful, but it's the clear part. You can see your pupil within and your iris through it as well. And remember that conjunctiva covers the whites of the eyes, but it stops around the cornea. It doesn't cover the cornea. Yeah. And because it bulges so much, we're going to see it actually bends about 75% of the light. You know, the lens is small, smaller proportion than this cornea. It bends so much. So it's going to really help you focus that light. Although it can't change shape, but it does a lot of the bending. Yeah. And the optic nerve uh, goes out the back of the sclera. And you'll have dura mater from the brain kind of like goes around that optic nerve. Oh, just some beautiful photographs by a photographer, just getting some different views. You're looking there, we see the cornea smooth and glass-like. You see the big pupil. You take this picture, you dilated the pupils, and there's drugs, atropine, things like that, that, that will dilate your pupils and then you know take a quick picture. Because if you're in bright light, that pupil's narrowed, of course. Mm, gorgeous. Mm, looking straight in. So we'll talk about that iris and what causes that color. And there's that pupil. And uh, this is a pupil dilated. And here's a pupil more constricted when it gets smaller. Cool. All right. All right, so let's move on. We'll talk about um, this iris is the, the colored portion of your eye in the front. And uh, it has uh, muscles in it that can, can constrict the pupil or dilate the pupil. We'll talk about that in a minute. And like a camera, we talk about being the aperture when you change the aperture of the lens, it's how much light you let in. And so in a dark situation, you need a little wide aperture. In bright light, you can do a narrow aperture. Yeah. And then within that, there's this, uh, this region here. So you can see the iris is right in front of it, but um, this is the ciliary body and there'll be ciliary muscles in it. And it does a couple things. Uh, one thing is gonna be, there's gonna be little ligaments that attach to the lens that change the shape of the lens. And it's also gonna produce this aqueous humor, this fluid that is going to wash over the lens and it's gonna fill up and bulge, make the eye bulge out. All right, so ciliary body keeps the lens suspended and it changes the shape of the lens. Yeah. And both of these are part of that choroid coat that a uh, uh, vascular middle coat. Yeah, and looking towards most of the eyes, you go to the back of the eye, it makes this choroid coat that we learned in the, in the, the cow eye. It's uh, not black, but it has this bluish, beautiful color to it. Well, it's dark black and it has kind of bluish in it too. Um, yeah, and uh, sure. Yeah, you're going to see the retina is this kind of this ugly kind of beige brownish colored thing that will go over it nicely. And that retina needs that choroid coat, lots of blood vessels to supply it with, with nutrients. Um, and that blackness back there will help prevent reflections in the eye, it will help absorb any excess uh, uh, light waves. So lots of melanocytes, just like in your skin, they make you tan, lots of making melanin back there to keep that black background to the to the eyeball yeah but but in the cow eye you saw it was reflective and uh here i am i caught a walleye uh, we, uh, we don't have those in maine do we no no we don't have walleye in maine but it's a type of fish called walleye because the eyes are big and reflective they live deep in the water um and then of course deer and uh your cats you know they have very reflective layer the choroid coat is not black called tapetum lucidum, it's very reflective. And so what nocturnal animals, they, what they give up in having a sharp image, they gain in being able to gather every little photon of light. So in us, the back of our choroid coat is black as it is in every camera ever made because you want the light rays to come in, hit the rods and cones, and then be absorbed because black absorbs all light. Now, if it was white, it would come in and then it would reflect and bounce around inside your eyeball, making your image blurry. So we have a sharp image, but it, when it gets dark, we can't, you know, we can't get every little photon of light like a deer could. Yep. 
And some people say that, that here, here in Maine that moose don't have the reflective light. Their eyes aren't reflective. And that's not true. That's a, that's a myth. The deal is your car headlights, they hit the deer's eyes, but moose are so much taller that you kind of hit the brown body. And so their eyes don't appear to reflect. But if you, you're in a big truck, they would reflect because the light is up higher. So yes, moose and deer both have reflective eyes, just our headlights or headlamps are little headlamps. Headlights are a little low for the uh, for the moose. Now, red eyes. You know, you get those pictures, and the eyes are all red. You look all like demons, uh, and that is what you're seeing. Is that if the light is reflected, it goes in and it reflects off the blood vessels in the retina, and it appears red. And you can have computer programs that, that red eye reduction, right? But then you get those cameras. You wonder, you put on red eye reduction, they they flash, and they take the picture. And what they're doing is that flashing is making everyone in the picture, their eyes, their pupils constrict, then it takes the picture. Because everyone's, you get red eye when, especially taking a picture in a, a dark environment and if people's pupils are big and then you, you get the back of their retina looks red. So red eye reduction will, will make their pupils small, then take the picture. That's the idea and then behind that annoying delay with that flash. Or you can, if you separate the flash from the camera, like in a professional manner. It's not gonna reflect right off the back of the eyes. Got it? You know what red eye is now? Good. Beautiful, look at that anatomy. Let your eyes feast over that eye anatomy. See how much you know. Beautiful. It's a couple of things. I, I'll just point out some things uh, that I, I haven't talked about too much. And I mean, here's that optic disc. That is your blind spot where the nerve leaves. And I'll get into why exactly. I'll show you why. And I haven't talked about the fovea, but that is directly behind your pupil. And that's where you have the sharpest vision. So I'll just call it a, there's a macula, luteum, like a yellow spot and then in the middle of it is this fovea, a little depression and that's just packed with cones so it gives us our sharpest vision all right so when you look at something you're looking at saying that's what you see and out of your periphery everything is actually well, our mind makes it up a little bit but it's blurry over here and it's sharp right in the middle so whenever we want to look at see something we look directly at it and the light is focused on that that fovea where you have the best vision yeah, and then back here, uh, this whole, most of the eye, this five, six of the eye back here is this posterior cavity. And it's filled with this jelly, this vitreous humor that just poured out it like jelly out of the back of the cow eye. <clears throat> That's there. And then we call this the, the, the anterior cavity is in front of the lens. Mm -hmm. yep. All right, guys, taking a, take a look there. I think, you know, I don't want to, Go over everything twice. All right, but let's take a look in the front. Oh, so look at how bulgy the cornea is. Just bulges out when you look at someone from the side. And what's going on here, you can see the lens and then notice the vitreous humor, like this big jello in the back, clear jello in the back. And the lens sits in the front. And then the ciliary body is gonna make this aqueous humor, this watery fluid. And it's gonna wash over the lens and it goes through the pupil and it goes on to this front part. And it's gonna, the pressure keeps that bulging of the cornea in the front. So we have this pressure in the front of our eye by constantly producing this fluid. And uh, it's gonna keep that, that bulge, the cornea. Um, this fluid, the lens, we're gonna see, doesn't have any blood vessels or anything. So this fluid helps keep nutrients and oxygen to the lens. Doesn't need much, but needs a little bit, doesn't it? And then uh, this fluid has to be reabsorbed somewhere because you constantly produce it. And so you have these this, um, veins that go all around the edge of the sclera that will absorb that fluid. Yeah. And so in this anterior uh, cavity, we really can separate into an anterior chamber and a posterior chamber. And then the pupil connects those two. So the fluid is made in this posterior chamber and then it goes through the pupil into the anterior chamber where it's absorbed.
but there's always some pressure there. Yeah, and then the lens, of course, beautiful. That lens, um, I'll show, we'll talk more about the lens for sure, but it's, uh, it's gonna help focus the light. And that's the thing that changes shape so you can accommodate or focus on things that are close. And I'll show you another picture from the front, but you can see that it's uh, around the lens, there's, a, there's a, a capsule around it and you have these suspensory ligaments, these delicate strings that go all the way around it, the circumference. And so they will pull on it and the lens will flatten or that the muscles will constrict and the lens will ball up. The lens wants to ball up. So yeah, the lens is suspended by the suspensory ligaments. And a sharp blow to the head can damage those and the lens can, can float free. Another view of the lens, but take a look at it. Here's the lens and you can see the suspensory ligaments are gonna change the shape of that lens as the ciliary muscle constricts or relaxes. And then you can see the iris is the colored portion and it's gonna make a circular pupil and also circular. Yeah. And then you see the sclera, you can see the cornea bulge out there. And the lens, again, it is living tissue, but it's clear, it's so cool. And so there's no blood vessels to block the light. They, they don't even have mitochondria or other, other uh, organelles in there. They just have tons of proteins that are just the same direction that give it, it makes it clear like a crystal. And uh, uh, so it's living, but it's almost like a non-living lens in there, you know, that's gonna allow light to come through and it can change shape. Now, if your lens gets cloudy and no longer lets light through, we call those cataracts. So cataracts, we're not always sure the cause. I mean, a lot of UV radiation sometimes causes it, a lot of bright sunlight, but as you get older, uh, your dogs and you know, are gonna have cataracts too. It'll become cloudy and cause blindness if it's uh, too bad. And they can, they just replace that whole lens. Um, they take it out and put a plastic lens in there. And, uh, it, it does the trick. All right, so looking straight at it, I can see here, I can see the lens and I see all these suspensory ligaments around the whole perimeter of this lens, right? And they're connected to these muscles, it's this ciliary muscles around it um, that are gonna change the shape of the lens. Um, when they constrict, they contract, they come in and then the lens balls up. And when they relax, it tends to pull the lens flat. So that's how we focus. We change the shape of the lens. Now your camera is completely different. Camera, you, the lens moves forward and backwards or in the microscope, forwards and backwards. And then there's some, some, some animals that do that. But we do it by changing the shape of the lens. You know, Imagine a camera where the lens changes shape. It sounds complicated. You know, We just move it forward and backwards as you, you turn the, uh, the lens. Um, and uh, the more balled up the lens is, the more it bends the light. And so if you're looking at something in infinity, the, the rays are coming parallel to you. But as things get closer, less than 20 feet or closer, the, the, the light starts bending because it starts bending more and you need to change the shape of the lens so it's more ball shaped, more um, con convex on either side, more, more more bendy, more round, and so it's going to bend the light more. So distance, the lens gets flatter, close up, the lens is balled up, so it bends the light more. Yeah, it's called accommodation, is this, um, this focusing. When things get within 20 feet or up, up as close as you can focus, is uh, you have uh, <clears throat> contracted that ciliary muscle to ball up the lens so you can see closer. Yeah, and of course, you know, we shine lights, especially my eyeball, shine it quite a bit to show you that uh, uh, the pupil is gonna change shape too. It's gonna constrict in bright light. All right, so take a look, see this? Focusing close, the lens is thick, it's balled up. Distance, the lens is thin, it's, been, it's pulled flatter. Yeah, and then uh, another thing is, so you can see here, when you're looking at things from a distance, the, the, the light rays are coming pretty much parallel. Um, but as things get closer, you can see there's the, the light is coming at different angles. And it, you, 
you need more of a focusing power. So the lens has to ball up more. And just to point out, you can see that our image is actually upside down and backwards right and left. And so your mind flips everything around to normal. How cool is that? Yeah. And then just to remind you of our blind spot where the, where the uh, optic nerve leaves, there's no rods and cones, you get a blind spot. And we saw that nice in lab. All right, so here's the pupil. And the pupil is formed by the iris. And um, which do you, do you guys remember like sympathetic and parasympathetic? Sympathetic is fight or flight. So that's gonna make your pupils dilate, get big, because you wanna get every bit of light. So if you're scared, your pupils get big. And then uh, parasympathetic will constrict them. Since, uh, so if you're a big Thanksgiving meal, your pupils are tiny, you're salivating, that kind of thing. And uh, if you're scared, your pupils get big, right? So remember, sympathetic, dilate, parasympathetic, constrict. And uh, there's muscles, radial muscles um, that go around it that will pull the pupil open and then circular muscles will constrict it. So you've got these pairs of muscles in your iris that work antagonistically to, to dilate or constrict your pupil. And as you guys go from dark to light to dark to light, your pupils change shape to give you the best image back there. In darkness, your pupils are huge. They gather all the light that they can. All right, and we'll talk about the color iris of your eye in a moment. All right, so here's that fluid. And here, the, I like the illustration down here. You can see the, the arrows where the fluid goes across the lens through the pupil and into that anterior uh, chamber up there. And then, yeah, I like that canal of Schlem. It's also called the uh, scleral venous sinus, I think. And so it's gonna help absorb it. And so it's important that absorption of the fluid is exactly matched to production of it, all right? Now, if you absorb too much or don't produce enough, uh, your cornea will flatten. There won't be enough fluid in the tank. And if your canals don't absorb enough, you're gonna have too much pressure. You're gonna build up too much pressure. So those, the production and the absorption of that aqueous humor has to be matched. Yeah, but this watery fluid will go over the lens and it's gonna, it's gonna feed the, the cornea because the cornea doesn't have blood vessels either. The lens, it's gonna, that fluid allows it to circulate and bring nutrients and oxygen to those tissues that have given their lives to being clear so that you can, you know, you can bring the light in. And being clear means no blood vessels. Yes, and so if you have too much pressure, it's called glaucoma. And you, you hear this because it's a, usually a disease of the elderly and that's why it's important to get your eyes checked when you get older. Um, it's because it's symptomless. Like you don't know you have glaucoma until the symptom might be blindness, you know, blindness starting because if there's too much pressure, it's gonna push back on the retina and constrict blood vessels and optic nerve issues. And um, you're gonna have blindness start. Yeah, and so they can give you drugs and you can get that fixed. The eye doctor, they'll, they'll blow a little puff of air on your, your cornea and they'll see if it's too tense, you know, then um, you have too much pressure. And so they can measure that with these instruments. Yeah, so here's a view of glaucoma. I mean, simulated showing a beginning of blindness. Over 60 years old, leading cause of blindness. Yep, yeah, this glaucoma. But if you get your eyes checked, they can catch it and they can, they can regulate it. Hey, all right. That seems about right. That'll be the uh, first lecture. So we have more to talk about, don't we? Uh, I've got to talk about the rods and the cones and uh, uh, nearsightedness, farsightedness, a lot more of the vision. So I'm um, going to go ahead and record the second part of, of vision. So hopefully this was helpful. Everything from we did eyelashes and eyelids, we got into the basic eye anatomy, and uh, now we'll get into the, the, the nitty gritty with the next lecture. All right, hope you guys are good.